Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Almighty God, to all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. No, my Lord, 
I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said to him, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, 
Let us approach with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed pure with water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and to good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks. Gospel truth. Amen? Amen. 
So let's be real clear. This passage is not talking about the final days. Jesus was responding to a specific question about the temple. Jesus gave them signs of when the desolation of the temple was about to take place. These were signs that they, Jesus' own followers, would be able to observe and experience not some far-off destruction that will happen on some a literal battlefield in the plain of Jezreel. Language about wars and earthquakes and cataclysmic events are common metaphors used in Scripture. They aren't supposed to be understood in literal terms. The Old Testament prophets regularly use this kind of language to talk about political and religious events of great magnitude. As we have discussed in our Bible 101 class, these metaphors are a regular figure of speech to help folks understand that something major is happening. They were to use to underline the emotional upheaval that is coming. You know, I personally think that it's a, it is at least a bit ironic that Christians, especially those who seem so obsessed with these kinds of passages, seem to be the most anxious. Especially when it comes to major shifts in our social and political and religious constructs. Did you notice that Jesus didn't tell the disciples to run for the hills? or withdraw from the world in anticipation of the turmoil that is to come. Notice that even in the midst of this commotion, Jesus says, do not be alarmed. This must take place. In the midst of it all, Jesus indicates that the disciples were to have hope, remembering that these events were just the birth pains the promise of things yet to come. So they weren't supposed to stock up on assault rifles and AK-47s. Amen? Amen? I want us to understand this clearly today. If we only relegate this text to speaking of the end time, then we run the risk of dis dismissing its ability to speak to us in our own day when our own transitional times happen, when our own personally life-altering events take place. We overlook the assurance these passages can give us in times where we wonder where God is in the midst of tumult. I want you to think about this. For a devout Jew, the notion that the temple the very sign of their symbol of their religious and national life would be decimated. That would be a horrendous thing to contemplate. For Roman Catholics, that would be like Rome, the Vatican, the Sistine Chapel, St. Peter's Basilica being wiped off the map. And no doubt when we think of other major events happening in our lives, events where our whole identity as individuals or as people are just wiped clean, annihilated, transformed, we too might get a little bit anxious. But we as Christians need to set the right balance in our response. Yes, Fear is an appropriate response, especially in some times, but that isn't our only option. We as Christians have a larger arsenal of responses. Apocalyptic times, times of destruction and upheaval call for clear vision, faithful insight, and yes, even patience. Love and compassion.
When we allow fear to be our compelling reaction, we can begin to see other options as obstacles that we need to overcome, especially if we sense that they jeopardize our safety and our security. Fear can also distort and induce blindness. Fear limits our ability to see the outstretched hand of support offered by sisters or brothers. Thus feeling alone and isolated, we can become either so desperate or so despairing that even angels begin to look like demons. Amen? Amen. So how do we guard ourselves against our tendency to get too worked up over transformative life events? We do so by allowing love to permeate everything we do. So that everything is steeped in love. That's when we'll be better prepared to withstand foreboding wind. In our New Testament lesson, the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews said, Let us consider how to provoke one another to love. That's a strange way of stating things, isn't it? Perhaps we might ask ourselves, what does it mean to provoke one another to love? Usually we go about provoking one another to anger, not love. Amen? Amen? We gotta know what that entails. We usually, when we provoke someone to anger, we do so by being a little bit relentless in doing things that hurt them. So I wonder, what might it be like to do what we can to incite, to go, to inflame, to urge one another into love and good deeds? that mean we have to be a little relentless in our love and our care and our support? Might it mean that we have to live in the here and the now rather than focusing on the possibilities of turmoil and uncertainty in the future? I like Eugene Peterson, the author of the Messages translation of this passage. Peterson writes, let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out. Encouraging love to one another. In helping one another out. Inventing ways to support one another. Inventing ways to urge one another on. Isn't that what it means to live together as sisters and brothers. The writer of Hebrews suggests that the way to help provoke one another to love is through our meeting together regularly. Not neglecting relationships one with another. It's about supporting and enabling genuine relationships so that affection can develop. And the antidote, antidote for catastrophe, the antidote for fear and anxiety is to be found right here. Right here among us. Right here with a sister and brother sitting next to you in the pew. People across the aisles. Peoples you might not always associate with. My friends, there is no doubt that stormy days do lie ahead for many of us. Some of us may already be feeling assaulted or besieged in some way or another. The current political scene seems to be fomenting more hatred and chaos. Hurricanes, droughts, floods, fires, terrorist attacks in Paris. They can all make it seem that our world is coming unhinged. Even the church is in the midst of a major shift in society. And our religious institutions themselves may be on shaky ground. Even so, even so, let us not react in fear. 
Let us not neglect to live faithful lives here and now. Let us not neglect to live together, provoking one another in love. For it is in community with sister and brother that we can be sustained until that time when God's true transformation does finally come. May it be so.
Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Please stand as you are. Let us share the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you.
feet scattered upon the hills were gathered together to become one bread. So let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory through Jesus Christ now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For through the single sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, you have sanctified your faithful and given us confidence to approach your table as your own children. For the love of your Son, who sits at your right hand, and by the gifts of your Holy Spirit that fills our hearts, Accept our prayers and praises, Father, as we join our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven in this unending song. see your goodness in the world around us and so we violated your creation abused one another and rejected your love yet you never cease to care for us and prepare the way of salvation for all people through Abraham and Sarah you called us into covenant with you you delivered us from slavery sustained us in the wilderness and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word made born of flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his friends, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Yeah. 
death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit that they may be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with Blessed Mary, St. Jerome, and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honored, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen.